May was the highest month on record until June. June was the highest month on record until July. 212,000 illegal encounters in that month alone. Something that doesn't happen. They're going to lose their job if they don't do what Joe Biden says. And you say something that doesn't happen. Oh, my goodness. And you said this was a waste of our time. This is maybe the most important thing we can talk about. The freedoms that are being taken from the very people we represent. Something that doesn't exist. You got to be kidding me. This, this is kind of stuff that just ticks me off because this is so basic. <laughs> the constitute. I mean, this is, this is fundamental liberty we're talking about. People's livelihoods. And you give us a lecture on something that doesn't exist. Will the gentleman I mean, yield then? No, I will not. <laughs> that is truly unbelievable. These Border Patrol agents, they know it exists. They know it exists. Oh, and here's the, here's the irony of that one. Here's the irony. We just had a briefing from Mr. Mayorkas, Secretary Mayorkas. You know what he said? When the people who violate the law come across, they're offered a chance to take the vaccine. They get a choice. They get a choice, but not the guys who busted their tail, working hard, protecting us. All they get is attacked by you guys. If they happen to ride a horse, they get attacked by you guys. They don't get a choice. No, this exists. This is a darn good amendment from my friend and colleague from North Carolina. This definitely exists. It is a fundamental issue the country is dealing with as we Reserves, speak. Reserves, the gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield all of our remaining time to the great gentleman from Ohio, the ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee, Mr. Jordan. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Americans want safer streets, affordable gas, and freedom. Instead, Democrats give us record crime levels, record inflation, and another bill attacking President Trump. Sponsored by the guy who spent years misleading the Congress and, more importantly, the country. On Trump-Russia investigation, on Mueller investigation, on impeachments. Remember when the sponsor of the bill said that his office didn't meet with the whistleblower? Found out that wasn't true. Remember when the sponsor of the bill told us that we would hear from the whistleblower during impeachment? We'd actually have real process instead of having hearings and depositions in the basement, in the bunker of the Capitol. Remember when the sponsor told us this, that there was more than circumstantial evidence that President Trump colluded with Russia? That turned out to be false. Bob Mueller said it was false. Everyone knew it was false. In fact, it was such baloney, even the Washington Post, even the Washington Post has had to retract and change things from stories because they said, oh, yeah, yeah, there was a lot of false information in that dossier that they used to go spy on President Trump's campaign. And I think this is important to understand. Sponsor of this legislation wasn't just any member of Congress, Mr. Speaker. He wasn't just any chairman of a committee in Congress. He was the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, the committee that gets additional information from anyone else in the country making those claims that were not accurate. So maybe instead of having another bill that attacks President Trump because Democrats are afraid he's going to run and he's going to win in 2024, so they want to do everything they can to attack him, maybe instead of another bill attacking President Trump, we should actually focus on things that the American people care about. You know, you can attack President Trump all you want. I know of one thing. A year ago, the border was secure. Sure was. A year ago, cities were safe. Safer than they are today. A year ago, we didn't have a 31-year high inflation. We actually had wages going up, real wages. A year ago, a year ago, we didn't have a Department of Justice, Department of Justice attacking moms and dads putting a label, a designation, a threat tag on parents who simply go to school board meetings and speak out against a racist hate America curriculum. No, we didn't have that a year ago. But you guys can keep attacking the president all you want, not addressing the issues that the American people care about. We're going to speak about the issues they care about. We're going to try to do everything we can to slow down your crazy agenda that is driving up the price of everything 
And we're going to speak out against and do everything we can to make sure the Department of Justice quits attacking parents. God bless the whistleblower who came forward and gave us the information. Sent from the Counterterrorism Division of the FBI. We could be dealing with that issue today. We could be holding the Attorney General accountable, the Justice Department accountable for what they're doing. No, no, no. We're going to attack President Trump again. Democrats, that's the only thing they can do because they can't talk about anything else. I hope we defeat this bill. Yield back my time. <laughs> what purpose does Mr. Jordan seek recognition? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Start, move to strike the last word. Gentlemen's recognized. So the Democrats have a bill that says to political jurisdictions, you, if you change your law, if you do it the way we want, you will give you money. And our, our colleague from North Carolina comes with an amendment and says, if you engage in certain behavior, we're not going to give you that money. It is entirely relevant. The chairman has twice now used the term ir irrelevant. This is as relevant as, as it gets. Last week, the Democrats started off the week with one of our colleagues from Detroit saying no more policing. We just heard, we just heard the, the gentleman from Rhode Island say the Democrats haven't talked about defunding the police. No, no, that's not one what of I their, said. One of their members said last week, we, we haven't want talked no about more it. policing. No more policing. And, and let me just, uh, the Democrat-run cities, New York City cut a billion dollars from its police department's budget and saw a 97% increase in shootings. Los Angeles cut $170 million from its budget, saw an 11.6% increase in homicides. Austin, Texas, $150 million cut, 50% spike in homicides. Portland, Oregon, a $12 million cut, eliminated three police, police units. Shootings went up 173%, murders up 25%. I would bet the people, the residents of those communities think this amendment is relevant, for goodness sake. Democrats started the week last week saying, get rid of police. They ended the week with one of our colleagues, Democrat colleagues, being admonished by a judge for the ridiculous things that they said. And somehow the gentleman from North Carolina's amendment's not relevant? Are you kidding me? This is as relevant as it gets, as timely as it gets. And I hope we could actually agree on something and adopt the gentleman's amendment. With that, I yield back. It's recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Democrats prevent Republicans from serving on the select committee. Democrats kick Republicans off standing committees. Democrats try to make D.C. a state. Democrats try to end the filibuster. They try to pack the court. They do secret impeachment hearings in the bunker in the basement of the Capitol. And they just said a naval veteran is afraid of the truth. And now today, now today they are destroying executive privilege. The United States Supreme Court held those who assist the president must be free to explore alternatives in the process of shaping policies and making decisions, and to do so in a way that many would be unwilling to do except privately. The court further stated presidential administrations of both parties have asserted that president's close advisors are an extension of the president. Who are these close advisors? Who are these individuals who are an extension of the President of the United States? Well, there's actually a bunch. But certainly the three most important are the National Security Advisor, the White House Counsel, and the Chief of Staff to the President. And I would argue the Chief of Staff is the closest of the close. He's the one who spends more time with the Commander-in-Chief than anyone else. Now, why do we have this privilege? Why do we have it? Why is the decision-making process between the president and his close advisors a private matter? Why is that? Well, guess what? The Supreme Court told us the answer to that one, too. Quote, executive privilege serves the necessity for protection of the public interest in candid, objective, and even harsh opinions in presidential decision-making. Let me just say that again. Executive privilege serves the public interest. It's for us. It's for we the people. It's not for President Trump. It's not for Mark Meadows. It's not for any president. It's not for any chief of staff. It's for the country. But the Democrats, they're not going to worry about that. They're going to forget about that because they think this is good politics. They think this is all about politics. They used to care. They used to care about executive privilege when Republicans wanted information. During the Fast and Furious scandal, President Obama asserted executive privilege for bureaucrats at ATF and DOJ. I mean, think about it. A bureaucrat in a federal agency gets privilege, but not the chief of staff to the president because Mark Meadows worked for President Trump. And Democrats have been out to get President Trump before he ever took office when they first tried to spy on him, actually did spy on him in 2016. 
They're going to destroy this precedent even though, even though this very question is in front of the courts as we speak. They're going to destroy this precedent that's been around since 1794 when our first president first asserted it. And for what? What did Mark Meadows do? He gave the committee thousands of emails. He gave the committee thousands of text messages. And he agreed to come in front of the committee and answer any question as long as it didn't violate executive privilege. The privilege that's not his to waive, it belongs to the president. The privilege that the court said is critical to executive decision making. The privilege that exists for the benefit of we the people. And the privilege that's been around since George Washington asserted it. But Democrats says, no, nope, not good enough, Mr. Meadows. You've got to come in and answer any and every question we ask you. Or we're going to try to put you in prison. It's disgusting. It is so disgusting. Think about it. We weren't allowed to know who the anonymous, so-called anonymous whistleblower was when they tried to impeach President Trump, did impeach President Trump, but Democrats can destroy executive privilege. We weren't allowed to, the country wasn't allowed to know what took place in that bunker in the basement of the Capitol during impeachment, but they get to know any and everything they want about conversations between the president and his top advisor. This is so wrong. Democrats on the select committee, they also can't make up their minds. With Steve Bannon, they said, you have to appear in person to assert any privilege. And because he didn't come, they held him in contempt. With Jeff Clark, they said, come in person, assert privilege, which he did. And they said, nope, that's not good enough. And they held him in contempt. And now with Mark Meadows, he gave him thousands of documents and agreed to come. And they still said, not good enough. Not good enough. What a, what a charade. Make no mistake. Make no mistake. When Democrats vote in favor of this resolution, it is a vote to put a good man in prison. That is what the, don't pretend to argue either. Don't even attempt the argument. No, no, no. This is just, a, this is just a house acting. The Justice Department will make a decision whether to prosecute or not. Come on. Is there anyone who believes that? It took the Attorney General all of five days to treat parents as terrorists. All of five days. If a left-wing political group can write the White House asking the Department of Justice to use the Patriot Act against moms and dads, and five days later the Attorney General of the United States does just that, then what do you think he's going to do when 225 Democrats in the House of Representatives ask him to put President Trump's chief of staff in prison? This is... I've been in Congress a while, 15 years. I've seen Democrats weaponize the government to attack their political opponents. Ten years ago, they used the IRS to target good people around this country, good conservative people. Five years ago, they used the, they used the FBI to spy on, abuse the FISA process, used the FBI to spy on President Trump's... Number four, on day one, he paused deportations. And number five, he moved to terminate the asylum cooperative agreements with Northern Triangle countries. And number six, he suspended enrollments in the Remain in Mexico program. Did any of those things factor into the conditions you described in your opening statement into this, this, this influx of people coming to our board? Did any of those six things that President Biden did on day one contribute to the situation we now find ourselves in? Mr. Chairman, it did. And that's all of it. it Every it single one. Every one of them changed. We, we went from what I consider probably on my 38-year career um, one of the most manageable borders, and that was also shared. I want to be clear what you said, Sheriff. The most manageable border we had in your 38 years in law enforcement was two years ago. Yes, it was. Okay. And then on day one, President Biden terminates the National Emerging Declaration on the Southwest Border, and that's contributed to the problem we now have, right? Yes, sir. And he halted construction on the wall. Is that contributing to the problem we now have? Yes, my border's frozen in time in my county. Yep. And he revoked President Trump's immigration enforcement priorities. Does that contribute to the problem we now see? It has. Including the fentanyl getting to communities and harming people like Mr. Dunn's son. Yes. Not harming, taking his life. He paused deportations. Is that hurting? That's what Mr. Roy was just talking about. It's all a collective message that the border is open. Terminated the asylum cooperative agreements and suspended enrollments in the Remain in Mexico program. That's contributing to the situation we now have. Yes. 
All right, so this idea that if we just give more agents, more, build more wall, put in the roads, more drones, more border security, which I'm all for, that's going to solve, that is not going to solve it until you go back to these policies. Is that right? That is correct. And Mr. Chair, if I could add one more thing is uh, before President Biden took office, myself and several other sheriffs on behalf of national sheriffs met with President Biden's transition team and went over all the current plans on the border to include what was working. I was told by his transition team, Sheriff, we appreciate all you're doing. I recently attempted to, or recently opened a portal for small business owners to appeal directly with them for forgiveness. Um, Chase, Bank of America, and PNC have opted out of that direct program. Is that correct, Mr. Demchik, Mr. Diamond, and um, Mr. Moynihan? I believe so. Yeah, I'm not aware of it. I'm not, a, I'm not aware of the answer. Okay, so um, for your awareness, uh, your banks have opted out of Paycheck Protection Program forgiveness, um, and uh, Excuse me, that, that, that is incorrect. It, with, with, the, with the portal, with the SBA. Thank you. I was trying to finish my sentence. Um, now, I would like to uh, zero in a little bit on Bank of America. Mr. Moynihan, are you aware of how many PPP loans uh, your bank has facilitated on behalf of its customers? About uh, 400, and almost 500,000, and 95% are forgiven or repaid already. Mm -hmm. And we're uh, up the rest of them. How, how many of those loans, uh, in terms of the percentage, have those loans been forgiven in full, as opposed to in part? The ones that are forgiven are mostly, vast, vast majority be forgiven in full. full. In full. Um, what we're starting to see here with some reporting in The Intercept, and this is just one reason why I was curious about the numbers, um, is that we're starting to see that uh, Bank of America is refusing to forgive some PPP loans in full, um, but in terms of the portal that Bank of America has set up, it's very difficult to appeal these decisions. And in fact, what we're seeing is that uh, Bank of America had pre-populated um, a forgiveness amount in their portal, sometimes drastically lower than, um, than small business owners had anticipated and had qualified for. And in instances where these small business owners have documentation, um, there's very little recourse or appeal. Uh, does your portal make it easy to appeal their decisions so that after two attempts, the SBA can then take over the case? Borrowers can appeal. 95% of the loans are forgiven repaid today, so we're only talking about the 5% of the loans and a substantial part of those are going through the appeal process as we speak. And so the borrowers can appeal, and we're in the process of finishing up that last 20,000 or so loans. It's a, it's, it's, it's a small amount of loans, and they're finishing And to process. certify that that 95% is a full forgiveness amount percent? Forgiveness or repayment. Some of them, full forgiveness, yeah. not partial. It, uh, the vast majority are full forgiveness, but I can get the data too. So is the 90, I apologize, not to you know belabor the point, but is that 95% a partial loan forgiveness or a full loan forgiveness rate? They're getting what the, the borrowers are applying for the forgiveness entitled on the program. 95% of them have gone through or repaid, and the vast majority of them are full forgiveness, but they're entitled to what the program designed. The government designed the program, and we implement the program very short notice. Mm -hmm. A half million people, 10,000 people working on this program. Mm -hmm. and, Easter um, weekend working on the program to help those borrowers at the time. Mm -hmm. And so... We're finishing that up. It's just, just let the process go. And a lot of what you're reading, frankly, is not the facts because it's old. It doesn't understand how the how the math works. And so just give us some time. We'll give you the facts, and you'll see it. Yeah, it's all so in the what, um, what is the reason that Bank of America chose to opt out of 